Welcome. Today we are still in the grip of a coronavirus lockdown. We'll discuss the nature of coronavirus and pandemics in general, and who better to shed light on these issues than Laureate Professor Peter Doherty. You heard right, he is a Nobel Prize winner. He shared the Nobel Medical Prize for his discoveries about transplantation and killer T-cell mediated immunity, which is particularly relevant to the coronavirus pandemic we're seeing today. He was Australian of the Year in 1997 and is also known as an Australian living treasure. And he's still active in the research community and he's doing stuff on immunity to influenza at the Doherty Institute which was named after him. <laughs> the big building um, right in the middle of Melbourne. He is the author of the book Pandemics, What Everybody Needs to Know, which is a topic of one of our previous interviews, which we did in about 2014. And he also did a talk at the Science Technology in the Future conference in 2013 on pandemics in the future. Despite his high profile, I found Peter really down to earth and easy to talk to. And science technology in the future is not prime time television. It's just a YouTube channel. But I feel that we're really lucky to host a Nobel Prize winner. Not only is a Nobel Prize winner, but he knows what he's talking about. So today we'll discuss COVID-19, its similarities and differences to influenza, how infectivity works, combating the coronavirus, achieving rapid responses to pandemics, the idea of strategic infection of COVID-19 or variolation, as some call it, which is the main topic of my recent interview with Robert Hansen. Also, we'll be just discussing rejuvenating the thymus to help boost our immunity with age, which is a major topic of my interview with Aubrey de Grey just recently, and also modeling viruses and diseases in computers. So, and there's much, much more. So you're in for a treat. So if you like this content, please subscribe and share to anybody who might be able to benefit from it. Welcome, Peter Doherty. It's great to have you here again. Yeah. Um, I've, I've interviewed before and we did actually did an interview like in 2015 on or was it 13 on um pandemics your book so yeah it's been yeah a while Great since we work. did an interview but yeah You're remarkably prescient to review pandemics in australia yeah. nobody had ever heard of it here so it was sold in the sold globally by oxford university press but it got very yeah. coverage in australia yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's start off with what's in, uh, around the nature of the COVID-19 virus. What is COVID-19 and how does our immune system respond? It's a, it's a coronavirus. It's what we call a beta coronavirus. Um, one of the common cold viruses is a beta coronavirus. You know, it's possible that that common cold virus jumped into human beings 10 or 100,000 years ago in much the same way as uh, COVID-19 has now, but it's just got very mild. So this uh, coronavirus, they're what we're called positive strand RNA viruses. Unlike influenza, they, though they do mutate and we can uh, track lineages. For instance, I've just heard that uh, we, can, uh, we can track within Australia where, where a particular virus may have came from, where it, whether it came from Ruby Princess or something else, on the basis of the little mutations in that virus. But it's not mutating like flu. Uh, flu has uh, lacks any proofreading mechanism, throws off enormous numbers of mutants. And so far with COVID-19, uh, the virus hasn't thrown off uh, mutants which would change virulence or change uh, 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 specificity for neutralizing antibodies, for instance. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty standard sort of virus, really. Uh, we expect uh, people will be infected, that they will be pretty solidly immune, at least for a few years. Uh, but of course, we don't know that because we've only known about the virus for a few months. So, so mm. long-term immunity is still a question. I think we can make a vaccine against it, but there are some, some, uh, some issues we have to be careful of. Right. Is it is it is it um, similar to the SARS virus that um, came out? Yeah. Of, seems to come out of wet markets in China. Yeah. So the, there are three viruses that are very similar. We believe all three have come out of bats of one sort or another. It mm. seems bats are an enormous reservoir of these things, and there's been mm. a, a Chinese lady scientist actually who's been looking very seriously at this. There's a lot of really good science going on in the Chinese Republic now, as well as in Hong Kong and so forth. But um, uh, it uh, looks as uh, SARS, we, we are pretty happy, uh, came from bats into a little animal called the civet cat, which was then through, sold through live animal markets. 
uh, it might have been infecting people for years, for all we know, but it, it was Chinese New Year and people traveling uh, spread it and uh, so forth. But the only, only spread outside Asia really was to Toronto, where one guy who was what we call a super spreader went from Hong Kong, I think, and caused an outbreak there. But otherwise, it didn't get into the West. Uh, then there's the MERS virus, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus. It's, we think, as a virus that's come out of bats, gone into camels, and uh, then from camels into humans. So, so I've actually, uh, one of the words of advice, if you're trying to protect yourself, is never kiss a camel. Um, this, uh, <laughs> people do. People do kiss camels. This, this virus uh, um, is killing 34% of people and infects. And it's still active, but it's only infected relatively no numbers of people. It's got from the Middle East. It, they have had outbreaks in Thailand and, and so forth in, East, in the more um, East Asia, I guess. I'm never, I'm never sure what East and West is anymore. It's East and West of what, you know. And uh, then um, uh, and, and SARS killed about 10% of people. This one kills many, many fewer people, but it's incredibly more infectious. The suspicion mm. is that it's come from bats, pro possibly through a, an animal, strange animal called the pangolin. Um, mm. But the initial focus of infection seemed to be around the seafood market in Wuhan, which is where the live animal market is. Uh, I didn't think at any stage it had come from seafood. We've never had a virus that's jumped into humans from cold-blooded species, as far as I'm aware. And the mm -hmm. pangolin, though it looks like a reptile, is actually a mammal. It has scales. Yeah, it's, it's a weird animal. But um, yeah, yeah, you mentioned like in 2013 or 14, we had a science technology in the future conference and that um, bat viruses were only recently become aware of. Um, yeah. Like the Australian bat, uh, I think it's Isavirus, Lysavirus. Lysavirus. We were talking we've about known, at the time. Yeah. Yes, yes, we've known for a long time that, that biting bats particularly uh, blood-sucking bats in, in, in South America will uh, bite cattle and cause rabies. We've known they've carried rabies. Rabies is what's called a lysavirus. And we've also had cases of case fatalities here of lysavirus. So we have a virus that's very, very similar to uh, rabies virus in yeah. our bats, but it's never made the jump into uh, biting carnivores the way rabies does. I mean, rabies is transmitted by a dog bite or a, a badger, I'm not sure about badgers, or a, a, a raccoon bite would be another one that would uh, do that, or a fox. And, and so, but we've never had that in Australia. But all, we have 300 licensed bat handlers in Australia. If you get a bat in your house, you never try to catch it. You call the RSPCA or whatever they're called in your state, and you uh, ask them to find you a licensed bat handler or ask for contacts so you can get one uh, because they're all vaccinated against rabies. And people consider that this virus, which is in our bats, is as close to rabies as, uh, as, as, as we can protect with a vaccine. So it's very similar, uh, mm. but uh, it hasn't jumped. But this sort of thing is right through nature, actually. There are all sorts of things that are a potential threat We'll just sit around and do nothing. Suddenly we've got a problem. Um, uh, that happens with plants too. You can have a plant, say, in the gardens, nothing happens for days. And then suddenly the damn thing's everywhere and nobody knows why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you've, met, you've uh, written, written a lot about uh, influenza before, I think. Uh, it was the main subject of your talk about science, technology and future. Um, this is extraordinarily infectious, but you were mentioning before that coronavirus doesn't mutate as much. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, sorry, the, 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 but the coronavirus is as uh, extraordinary infectious, perhaps even more so, but this is what makes it um, dangerous. Seasonal flu um, is arises because of mutation. Is that something we don't need to worry? We don't need to worry about a seasonal COVID virus like a, a COVID-21 or something? Uh I think it's less likely, but it's something we'll, we'll watch. I mean, the question will be with this virus is once we've got good herd immunity, that is many, many people have been infected and recovered, or we've had a very good a, a vaccine, which has em, embellished and expanded that herd immunity to just about everyone, 
the question is whether this virus will maintain in nature uh, if, by human-to-human transmission. So uh, we know influenza viruses do because influenza viruses mutate very easily and the seasonal flus are simply mutation, mutated versions of the standard flus and we have to deal with that, that with about one of those about every, every year really. Uh, and that's remarkable too actually because the mutation rate in flu is enormously high. It's throwing off enormous numbers of mutants but we still only have to deal with one of them or in, in a particular year. So, so there's, it's not a very efficient process for getting into humans and creating a major new pandemic, uh, epidemic rather. We call them seasonal epidemics, but they right. will be global. And uh, people in the norovirus field, you know, the thing that causes diarrhea on cruise ships, if anyone ever wants to go on one of these damn things again, uh, <laughs> they, they're mutated virus and they call them pandemics. So it's just a, a, a matter of nomenclature. Uh, so, yeah. um, and of course, the pandemic strains of flu are the ones that come in from another species, from pigs was the latest one, or from wildlife or whatever. Well, so talking about nomenclature, what is the difference then it, between pandemics and epidemics? So I mean, epi means like over and above, right? So is pandemics just like an like a local case of an epidemic? Or? A pandemic is 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 a global a global infectious disease issue with a with a new virus that's come into the uh, human population. I, I, you can look at the HIV. Uh, situation as an, a continuing pandemic, if you like. I mean, it's still active. It came into uh, the human population in the in a big way, at least in the uh, beginning of the 1980s. Uh, it may have been in human beings before that, but didn't get out of Africa or wherever. And so, uh, so it's a, I, I think of that as a continuing pandemic. Uh, pandemic for influenza. Uh, the definition used to be that. It was a novel virus that had come from somewhere else and it had just spread between, I think it was two or three WHO regions. Now that's very arbitrary because the WHO regions aren't like, say, taking one of those chocolates that's shaped like an orange and is in little mm -hmm. segments. They're, 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 some of them are really close uh, because it, it depends on where the regional offices are. Uh, and that was the definition of the 2009 pandemic. People got in, they got into trouble about that because everyone thought pandemic means horrible, terrible disease. But in actual fact, their definition, the WHA definition back in 2009, was simply on the rate, on the spread of it. So uh, people were a bit sceptical after that of the WHO pandemic definition because 2009 swine flu didn't seem any worse than uh, the usual seasonal flu. There are reasons for that we could discuss later. Mm -hmm. The other thing about flu viruses is when they do mutate, uh, apart from mutating to avoid neutralization by the immune response, and that's why they escape and may become new seasonal epidemics, when they do mutate and change virulence, they generally uh, become less virulent. And uh, that's what happened in 1918 with the terrible pandemic. By 1919, the virus wasn't causing as much disease, wasn't as severe. It was still bad. By, by 1920, it was just part of the influenza background, really. Hmm. So this lot, did you, did you say the swine flu was um, not as dangerous as a seasonal flu? Like It, it, it didn't look that way to people. Uh, and the reason for that was with influenza, we usually get an, a novel pandemic influenza, we, and with a seasonal, we usually get a U-shaped curve. The very, very young are very susceptible because they have had no prior experience of any type of influenza. And the very old are susceptible, uh, or the older from 70 on are susceptible because uh, their immune systems are failing in the sense of being able to deal with a new challenge. But the reason that 2009 one looked pretty mild was the older people weren't affected much. And the reason for that is we had a very similar virus uh, in 1977. So a lot of people have been infected with that virus at the time uh, and when they were younger, and they were now seemingly immune to the new virus. Uh, it had uh, cross, it cross-reacted. Uh, they were both what we call H1N1 viruses, though from different origins. And so we didn't get those uh, usually high de higher death rates in the older. What we did see, though, uh, was it was bad in indigenous communities, as flu virus always is, 
it always infects and damages our indigenous communities more than it uh, it uh, does the broader community. And the other thing about it was it was putting quite a number of fit young adults in hospital, very sick, some in ICU, some dying, including heavily pregnant women. And that was a characteristic of the 1918 pandemic. The virus, it wasn't a U-shaped uh, uh, pandemic, it was a W. And so the, the, it was the very young were very susceptible. Then it came up again for the fit young adults, dropped off again a bit, and then was worse again in the elderly, of course. Hmm, that's strange, yeah. Mm. Well, there's been, okay, let, let, let's, um, I wanted to ask about the various responses around the world, especially earlier responses to this um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of them were dismissed. Some people were quite dismissive um, and weren't really listening to the science. So now it's a good opportunity to, to talk about science communication. So what went wrong there, do you think? I, like, I, for instance, like well, you know, Trump. We're kind of all into denial, and it depends how closely you're watching a situation. We, we really don't want to acknowledge those horrible things out there that are going to get us, unless unless it's a horrible thing that a horrible person did. We, we love to think about bad guys, you know, all these really bad guys. That's why we have armies, because, you know, we think we're going to be attacked by really bad guys. But we, uh, we don't like to think so much about bad bugs. And, you know, some of the people... Uh, who I think are extremely irresponsible, have tried to transfer this discussion from a bad bug to the bad guys. Yeah, there's always mm. it. it was a terrible Hollywood movie called Outbreak, which ah, is yes. that absolutely ridiculous movie. But, you know, at least one of our uh, major national le leaders lives as though he's the personal star in a Hollywood movie. And all you do is rewrite the script if you want to change the course of the, of the problem. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So... So I think there was a lack of uh, engagement at the beginning. And then we started to see what was coming out of Wuhan and anyone in the science community who worked on infection and immunity became very concerned. Uh, Mike Catton here at, the, uh, at our institute, uh, who runs Vidral, which is the, the state virus diagnostic reference lab in uh, Victoria, which is part of our institute. That's why our institute's unusual, because it incorporates the state diagnostic labs for bacteriology, virology, World Health Organization, Influenza Center, and all that stuff, along with the standard academic department. Uh, we're the closest Australia has to what the Americans call a CDC, Center for Communicable Diseases. And uh, so Mike picked up on it early. He said, this is worrying. The, um, the, the Chinese put out the sequence of the virus. So by before the 25th of January, I think it was, uh, when we actually diagnosed our first case, I think, uh, from a traveller, uh, Mike had already set up the PCR test, and so we were ready to go in that sense. So we were testing right from the beginning and had a sensitive PCR test is very sensitive. You know, it's based on the test we use to detect genetic material from rapists at, and it amplifies genome. So Mike had it, that already set up, and they were ready to go with this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned Outbreak, another another movie that um, was brought up at, during your talk at the, the conference I mentioned earlier was Contagion. But that's is that more that's a far more realistic uh, film. Is there any other uh, realistic uh, films or shows that people can watch and, and hope to learn something from <laughs> other than documentaries, of course? <laughs> I, I think Contagion, in the main, is a pretty good movie. Uh, it, it's, it's a horrific. It's, it's, it's the same sort of scenario uh, as, uh, as for COVID-19, basically. It's a virus that goes from a bat to a pig to a chef and then mm. to Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and Gwyny, who's in Hong Kong, pops mm. on a plane, uh, goes to mm. Chicago, she has a bit of a dalliance in Chicago. <laughs> Basically, she's the most infectious human being that's ever lived. I mean, mm. anyone who looks at this woman gets infected. Mm. Uh, and uh, so they all start to die around it. So it's infinitely worse than this infection. And mm. I don't know if that would actually be true, that we would get something that is that lethal spreading like that. It's interesting. COVID-19, the, the SARS-2 coronavirus, as when they're calling it, is... Um, is the least lethal of the three. SARS is the most, uh, MERS is the most, 
people south the next and then COVID-19 is the least. And so I think I've always thought that a really, really dangerous thing, you pick it up so quickly that, that you jump on it and stamp it out, hopefully. Uh, but poor old Gwynny dies and, and, you know, she transmits it to, and, the, and the health of the, uh, the CDC officer, actually, uh, who, um, who goes to investigate it, uh, uh, she, she, she dies eventually. Uh, the one bit about it that's not realistic is they, they develop a vaccine and they have it out there in about three weeks, I think. So, you know, that, yeah. that bit's yeah. wrong. But otherwise, the, um, the director, um, I forget the director's name, but he's, he's known for making serious and thoughtful movies, uh, took the advice of Ian Lipkin, uh, in Columbia University, who's an infectious disease specialist. And usually I think Hollywood movie makers just, are, they're not interested in fact, they're interested in entertainment, but, but uh, this movie maker was actually interested in trying to get something realistic across. So it was, uh, at the time, the thinking man's horror movie, <laughs> which mm -hmm. meant nobody much watched it really because it was too serious for them to, uh, they, they want a bad guy, I think. In, uh, yeah. We all like bad guys. I, I like watching murders on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's strange about our psychology how, yeah, we're, 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 we're particularly attuned to um, some dangers and pretty bad at detecting others, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, I, think, I think for hard lab scientists like me, you know, I'm a lab scientist and um, not, a, not a medical doctor, so I'm not seeing patients and all, talking to people a lot. The medical doctors are much more aware of this, but, but when HIV hit, I think all of us in the lab sciences suddenly started to realise just how very important and actually how difficult the social sciences are, that it's behaviour that's enormously important in this and in this disease as well. So uh, that's why they put out those ads at the time of HIV, of the bowling ball, knocking people down and all the rest of it. You know, they were knocking down nuns and all sorts of things. Well, that, I remember you know, that ad, yeah. Cowards <laughs> just, they were very randy nuns. They were pretty safe. And uh, um, unless they got a blood transfusion that was contaminated, and our blood supply uh, at least was really quite safe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well... I'm just wondering, is there is there cause to be is there much cause to be really concerned about the COVID nineteen pandemic? And if so, is there a, a fine line that we need to put, like walk on in order to um, not sort of get people into too much of a panic and act irrationally, but at the same time get people to act really rationally um, and you know socially isolate and then, social isolation? We're all going to get cabin fever. If we sit around at home all day, what are we going to do? Yeah, so I mean, the social sources yeah, I, 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 I think uh, uh, the government thinking, uh, as I understand it, I'm, I can't speak for the government. I'm not talking to the prime minister or the health minister. I'm, I'm just speaking from the conversations we're having around the lab. We have weekly, uh, three times a week strategy meetings. I listen to those. And if I've got questions, I ask particular people. And that's great. And that's where I get a lot of my information about what's going on locally, apart from the very good local websites, the federal one and the state Victorian one that tell you a lot of what's happening. And there are very good global websites too. A lot of information out there if people want to seek it out. And basically, uh, um, I think we've done exactly the right thing. I mean, we, to some extent, uh, people have been frightened by it. They've been seeing horrible uh, images uh, uh, coming across. So they're scared of it and justifiably so. Though most people uh, are going to have 80% plus are going to have an inapparent or a mild infection. And, uh, and we know that uh, for most younger people, they're probably okay. We get the occasional death in a child or a younger person. I think if you go up to about age 60, uh, the total of the deaths in that uh, from, from zero to 60, I think it's about 5% of the deaths are in that group. So there is a risk. And uh, people should be aware of it, but they're not at enormous risk. But the death rates uh, ramp rapidly up after age 60, 70, 80. And uh, so it's people of my age that are particularly at risk. Uh, so, you know, the, the question is, how do we proceed with this? Uh, we've been successful, we think. From what we can see, the, the community transmission rate is, is very low. Um, and, uh, and we always thought it was low. We would actually, though people were saying we're not testing enough, we were actually doing a lot of testing and uh, by international standards. We weren't seeing a lot of infection, even in people who are presenting 
as uh, coming back and they had colds and flu and all that sort of stuff. We weren't seeing a lot of positives, about 1%. Maybe it's 2% now in that same sort of group, people coming in to be tested. We're not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and, uh, but the, but uh, so we, we didn't have a community transmission problem going on in the background. I think Europe and uh, the United States simply didn't take it enough seriously enough. I think there was a lot of community transmission going on and uh, um, uh, certainly it's for at least six weeks in the United States and it's everywhere. If you look at the maps uh, that New York Times puts up, for instance, you can see it's everywhere and many parts of the country it's doubling in incidence number of cases every five days. So it looks as though we've avoided that. We've shut down early enough. Uh, we've had some numbers. Though people may think we get enormous numbers of tourists, it's nothing like Europe does. And, uh, and so I think uh, we, may have, uh, we may have caught it. And, uh, and we can actually now, uh, if you, because of the little mutations in the virus, not that it's changing virulence or changing uh, antibody specificity, because of those little mutations, uh, I've just been hearing how we can actually trace the, where a particular virus would have come from. Um, you know, uh, one with a healthcare worker, for instance, Ben Howden was talking about this, where one with a healthcare worker, where we know it didn't come from the, from the hospital, but we know it came from a party he went to, for instance. So that's very, that's very good. So if you can trace at that level, you can really trace. And so what may happen as time goes by, if we can really, really keep it low, is uh, we, we, we presumably they'll, they will relax some of the controls. They'll have to be prepared to put them back on again, but uh, presumably they'll relax some of the controls because it's costing an enormous amount of money and it can't go on forever. That's part of the equation. I mean, we've got to Absolutely. be realistic about this. Our, our whole strategy really has been directed not at getting rid of the virus. So, you know, if we're extraordinarily lucky, we will have, except we won't be able to allow anyone in without two weeks quarantine. But um, our whole strategy has been directed at flattening the curve, keeping the case numbers down so we don't overwhelm our hospitals and our intensive care units and our doctors and nurses. And we don't want a lot of tired doctors and nurses uh, trying to care to ICU patients where you might have to put a tube in their throat. You can get an enormous amount of infection through vaporised droplets that are very small, get deep in the lung and stuff. We don't want that to happen to these 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 guys because they're they're the front line, they're the they're the soldiers, and uh, and we need to protect our army. That, that's also true of police, uh, checkout operators at supermarkets. All these people are in the front line, and we should have all applaud them. I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, that's a really good way of putting it. And um, yes, flattening the curve has been the mainstay of much of the messaging putting up there by the government and other governments around the world as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good initiative. But social distancing isn't perfect. I mean, like a society is porous. I mean, it's, it, all it takes is just random chance, like, you know, going to the supermarket, which we all need to do and someone's affected there. Yeah, so, yeah, we're all I, people my age particularly are worried about the random chance uh, type yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing shopping for my supermarket. The supermarket's been pretty satisfactory. My wife tells me at seven in the morning, uh, if you get there early, uh, all the the distancing is all marked out. The numbers allowed in are all marked out. Um, checkout operators are behind plastic screens. And so uh, if you're wearing a reasonably decent mask, which is probably a good idea in the supermarket, uh, she's made one from a table napkin. You can make, a, mm -hmm. a, I think, a, actually a mask that in some ways would be better for this sort of purpose from a table napkin that's wi finely woven. Uh, mm -hmm. She has six layers of cloth over her nose. Uh, <laughs> uh, her face She's running around looking like a bandit. Uh, no, she looks uh, rather colourful, actually. <laughs> and, uh, it's rather a nice table napkin that uh, yeah. it, uh, doesn't have anything embarrassing on it. So, uh, mm. uh, and, um, and the other thing about that is that when she gets home, all she does is take that off and throw it in the washing machine. So mm. she's not worried about sterilisation. She's only doing this every couple of weeks. So it's, it's I think, not a bad way to do it. And, and she's not depriving a healthcare worker of a mask, which uh, we're still short in short supply. So, so I think that's the issue. Yeah, but, but what could happen, and what could happen with this, is if the case numbers really go way, way down, there are various ways of checking community transmission. One is uh, when you do get a case, then you 
test very intensively all around that person, all their contacts, people in that local area. And we've now got enough testing capacity to do that. Uh, we can now test very intensively in what you might call a potential hotspot. Uh, the second thing we can do, and this is done, has been done over the years for things like polio and for the norovirus, the one that causes diarrhea on cruise ships, we can test sewage. And uh, you can pick up uh, um, uh, one in 10,000 uh, uh, positives. So if we went to that and we were testing sewage from particular locations, um, initially just from the whole of the urban community, but, but then from particular locations in urban and rural communities uh, through the sewage system, we could say whether the virus is active in that community because, you know, it does come out in uh, stool and so forth um, mm. and can be picked up. The genetic material can be picked up. May not necessarily be, be any in, much infectious material there, but the genes may be there. And, uh, and so we don't think uh, stool transmission maybe is, is terribly important, except maybe in the acute stage. It was important in SARS. We, we know that from a, a building in Hong Kong, which had a very poor sewage system, which was infecting people, actually, because the pipes were all sort of interconnected. Oh, that's interesting, because I watched a video where somebody says that that was a, a, an issue. Um, it could, you know, stool to mouth, um, he called it. Uh, but, yeah, OK, well, it's great. I'm glad to hear that it's not. Um, <laughs> So we don't talk about not a major issue. We think yeah, yeah. the main issue, the main issue with transmission is droplet inhalation. If you're inhaling, mm -hmm. that's why the 1.5 to 2 meter distance, if you're in still air, um, is important because. And we also think um, that it, I mean, if you did say use the table napkin type mask, we think it might be reasonably good uh, at keeping out say five or six micron droplets. It wouldn't be good for, for the smaller droplets, but we think it might be reasonably good. So um, that, that might be a plus, but you don't need to wear it, wear a mask if you're out in, in, in clean air, I think, and you're keeping away from people. Um, how you approach the supermarkets and so forth is another matter. Um, it's, it's the ICU docs we're really worrying about, those small uh, droplet-tized particles. And then the other way, of course, you get infected is hand to face. And so that's why... Uh, yeah, that that's why there's all the hand washing advice, and and then also um, it can survive certainly three days on plastics, um, um, cardboard, various estimates from seven hours to twenty four hours. But that would depend on the cardboard as much as anything else. It would also depend on how you did the experiment. If you put the virus on in the usual sort of tissue culture fluid, we'd grow a virus in. Uh, it probably wouldn't have survived all that long on, say, cardboard. But if you put it on in mucus, snot, phlegm, that stuff, it had survived longer because a lot of viruses will survive much longer in mucus. And it will survive very long if you're shedding any infected cells. That also happens. So you can't really say absolutely, but I treat um, anything you bring into the house. When there's a lot of infection around, I treat anything in in the house uh, you bring in as potentially could be infected. So, uh, you know, just be careful the way you handle it at that stage. Um, mm -hmm. But if you set thing, set a plastic bag aside for three to five days or something, uh, it's probably fine. Um, just if you were putting it straight in the fridge, you might want to wipe it down with a bit of alcohol or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah, must remember that after shopping. Um, well, let's talk about the current research uh, uh, into COVID-19. You know, how do we combat this? What research programs at the moment do you think look promising in general for generally combating COVID-19 and um, coronavirus? Well, there are two ways, apart from trying to understand the disease a lot better, because we've only seen the disease now for less than a, for four months. So there's still a lot of work on understanding what the actual disease is, the severe disease. And there's some interesting aspects to that uh, that, uh, that may be very different from flu. And I hadn't realised that until I actually saw an English physician talking on, uh, uh, an ICU guy, I think, talking on TV last night, saying there may be a problem with oxygen exchange rather than with clogging up the alveoli, the end, end stage of the lung uh, bronchioles and stuff with, with crap, which is what will tend to happen with flu, there may actually be a problem at the oxygen exchange level, which is really interesting, which would suggest other sorts of approaches that people uh, who um, do haematology for a living would know a lot more about than I would. So I, I'll be interested. People will no doubt be following up on that very aggressively. 
But uh, the two solutions we have to this uh, that come out of the lab, I mean, the lab solution uh, contribution at this stage has been all the testing. Um, and uh, and uh, but, um, but to set that aside for a minute, the two possible solutions are a vaccine, uh, which I think we can make, but it, it, you know, as everyone says, it'll probably take at least a year. Um, most optimistic es estimate I've heard from one of the American vaccines is that if it goes ahead and it all looks safe, uh, they could have the human safety testing uh, to the stage where they, they're looking at large scale human safety tests, uh, human efficacy testing, what we call a phase three trial, say, uh, from September and uh, production uh, product to get out into people's arms in early in the new year. So that would be about the fastest you could possibly go. And that means everything has to go well. It has to be protective when you do what we call preclinical testing. We have to do those initially in, in say, lab animals. Ferrets uh, can get infected a little bit, so you can use them. And then you, you need to go to uh, uh, rhesus macaques or one of the monkey species. Um, there's a, a, a manipulated mouse model too that you could use. So if it looks good in preclinical stages, then you go through safety testing in humans and you, you, you scale up the numbers in those tests and, and so forth. So vaccine, that's, uh, that's the way that uh, would really uh, do this. The only concern about a vaccine is vaccines don't work all that well on the elderly. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and we're the target group, of course. So, so there's another possibility, and there's also enormous activity on this. I'm aware of a little of it, and that is to find specific antiviral drugs. Now, we know that some uh, drugs may have a bit of activity. They're being t tested. There's an anti-influenza one. There's an, an anti-HIV uh, drug. There's an anti-Ebola drug. Uh, there's uh. hydroxychloroquine that President Trump's talked about a lot. They're all going through tests in, in proper randomised clinical trials. So we know whether they actually do something or it's just anecdotal because that's always a problem. You know, it's so easy to fool yourself with these things, especially when you want a good outcome. So that's been done. But there are also uh, both people doing large scale compound screening, uh, drug discovery. They have enormous numbers of compounds and they simply screen across to see whether they're likely to bind to the virus and stop it infecting the cell. And then, uh, then we also have people doing what's called uh, drug design, designer drugs. A uh, designer drug would be Relenza or Tamiflu, the anti-influenza drugs. And Mark von Itstein in Griffith University, who made the initial uh, Relenza, along with Peter Coleman and Graham Laver, um, other Australian scientists, who made Relenza is, is actually doing that. So this, this is a process where you try and match your knowledge of the structure of the viral protein that's determined by what we used to call X-ray crystallography, we now call structural biology. That's oh. where we'd be using the big synchrotron out at Monash University. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then by knowing the structure, you design a molecule on your computer to fit it, and then you can see whether that molecule can be made and used. So you're collaborating with various other people. I always say that if you're a, a kid who's a computer nerd and has few social graces, this is the job for you. But uh, in actual fact, I mean, Mark's quite an affable sort of guy. So uh, that's not true at all, really. Um, he's quite a normal human being. Mm. So but the point about the, the drug that I want to come to, okay. is these drugs can be used to treat and get rid of the virus in, in an infected person, but they can also be used for prevention or what we call prophylaxis. So what, what you would think of there is there's a drug uh, called, um, I'm, I'm forgetting on the name of the drug, but it's actually two anti-HIV drugs, anti-AIDS virus drugs. And what happens is that people who are at high risk, which means their behaviour is high risk of contracting AIDS, can take this drug every day because it's the same virus that's used to treat. So what you could do uh, for the elderly is have uh, a drug like that, which they would take every day and uh, just stop them uh, getting infected. And of course, uh, most of us are doing that for blood pressure or cholesterol. Uh, everyone in the HIV community is taking anti-HIV drugs if they're positive, which keeps the virus down. So there's nothing very remarkable or revolutionary about this. We would just have to get those drugs through and safety tested to make sure that they're okay to use in humans. 
it, it could be a lot more straightforward actually testing a drug than a vaccine uh, because uh, we can test the drug for efficacy and in severely afflicted people you can you can always go a bit further with someone who's um, very very severely uh, compromised by an infection for instance in testing you can take more risk because they're likely going to die anyway so it's easier to get approval because everything has to be approved nothing nothing gets put into humans without um, approval mm. yes interesting wow a lot to think about there but um well, what about rapid response i mean like at the moment like we could have if we had have been able to detect it we could have actually achieved a rapid response we had the tech the know-how uh you mentioned h7n9 i think it was during the, the uh and and seed stocks and the, the, the uh, where we have you created a great deal of um, seed stocks that would be ready and prepared to boost into a vaccine um, if there was a uh, a scare given a certain like a uh, virus. Um, is there was there anything done on, with coronavirus in this well, regard? That's the issue. You know, with, with flu viruses, when a novel flu virus comes along, we can go fairly quickly to a vaccine because we've got all the strategy and the safety testing done for other flu viruses. So the, the general uh, um, attitude of uh, regulatory agencies like Food and Drug Administration in the United States, our TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, is that, um, that we can go forward quickly with these because we've got so much experience with flu vaccines. With H7N9, this was a virus that came along um, oh, God, I, I forget exactly the year, uh, 2017, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. that, it, But it's a, one of these viruses that jumped from chickens into humans, like the original bird for the H5N1, and it was killing humans, uh, particularly older people, as flu viruses do, particularly older men, in fact. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we were very concerned that this might jump into humans, but after the big bird flu scare in 2005 with H5N1, um, we, we just got ready to go if we needed to without producing a lot of product. And uh, um, we didn't have to do it. It didn't make the jump. It didn't start to transmit between humans. It was just bird to human. So that you can interrupt fairly quickly. You get rid of live bird markets and so forth. And you make sure that people, particularly in urban settings, are not handling live chickens that, that can catch this. So that was handled as was the H5N1 earlier. And uh, so we can do that with flu quickly. Well, it's, in hindsight, it's a pity we didn't go further with testing the candidate SARS vaccines that were being made, MERS vaccines. Some of the, these were giving a bit of safety signal. They were, there were a couple of vaccines that signaled that maybe they made even the disease worse in monkeys. So we, we wouldn't want to go on with them. But there are other ones that looked as though they were fine in monkeys. And it would have been good, actually, if some of those vaccines had gone into people to check they were safe, because we'd probably be able to use that as a background for the um, for the, uh, the, the this virus and go ahead. But uh, perfectly naturally, the vaccines were dropped because um, because uh, uh, there was just no SARS threat anymore. The virus wasn't around. Uh, there was still work going on on the MERS virus. It still ticks away. It's still there. And it, uh, I think there were over 200 cases in 2019, but that was worldwide. And um, so, so, uh, and what did happen was that some of the um, some of the people who've been looking at this a lot, for instance, like Bill Gates's organisation that's been doing a lot to combat uh, these diseases, where the, uh, the the funding isn't there to study them because they're not an immediate threat, and from the pharmacology industry. Uh, pharmaceutical point of view, there's no income stream that would come from having the products. But they set up this um, uh, um, pandemic vaccine preparedness uh, fund, and that's the fund that for two years uh, supported the research at Paul Young and his group at the University of Queensland, whose protein clamp vaccine, they supported the research on developing the basic platform, uh, which is uh, a platform that keeps the structure of the virus protein in, in good shape because we want that for a good antibody response. And uh, that vaccine uh, that was supported by uh, SIPI, uh, I think it is, I always forget acronyms, um, for two years uh, is now in uh, trial uh, in the CR, big CSRO animal lab at Geelong. And uh, uh, the CSRO is producing a lot of that stuff 
and we're doing a lot of the lab testing for them. So that's the first Australian vaccine to get off the ground. There are other candidates being made, uh, including in our institute, of different types of vaccines. The Americans already have an, an mRNA vaccine that's message, it's genetic material to make protein. Uh, they, they put that into arms of people uh, some time back now. So they're, they're pushing on fast with that. I think there are something like some 60 vaccine candidates in various sorts of testing at the moment. And uh, and the question is how quickly we can bring forward a safe vaccine. So so the the international fund was good for that. I think now what we need to push for after this is over, uh, keeping up that strategy and maybe funding it a bit better for other potential threats. Um, so and the other thing we need to think about is uh, is maybe uh, having a similar thing for drugs, antiviral drugs because the Relenza and Tamiflu and Laminavir and all these drugs against influenza neuraminidase work across all the influenza viruses, seasonal viruses, pandemic viruses, and influenza B viruses, which are a different type of influenza virus that's maintained only in humans. All those, those drugs all work against the whole class of it. So if we pushed ahead with an anti-SARS drug that blocks some part in the pathway that was shared with this virus, we'd be in a lot better shape for therapy. So I think we need an international agency paid into by government or whatever, philanthropists, uh, to fund long-term drug research into classes of virus that are a potential threat. Um, you might think, for instance, about the, um, the, the Nipah virus, which is a virus that jumped from bats into pigs into people, different type of virus but it's been circulating a bit in Southeast Asia and up as far as India. And so that class of viruses, I think we should think about blocking drugs because we're at, as our population grows uh, and we clear forests and all this sort of stuff and we have this rapid travel all around the planet, we're going to always be at risk of these things. And uh, uh, 1918, it, uh, we didn't get the virus in Australia until 1919. It had come by ship. Uh, mm. so, that's what protected a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Controversially, in lieu of actual vaccine that could come, uh, I guess, hopefully in nine months, but maybe even in 18 months, if things go OK, um, if social isolation doesn't work well enough, too, would something like strategic or voluntary small dose, low dose infection like variolation uh, work in order to gain immunity or nudge herd, herd immunity? Um, is that something that we should be considering? Well, uh, let, let's tell people what variolation was. Uh, variolation comes uh, at probably about a thousand years old or more. It was first done by the Chinese. And what they did is they took, I mean, smallpox was a terrible scourge. Uh, it killed people. It disfigured the ones that survived. Never wiped humanity out. I don't think it's likely that an infectious pathogen would wipe out humanity, but uh, and certainly COVID-19 won't because 80% of people are fine. But uh, what, what they did early on in China uh, was they took a bit of smallpox material that causes pox on the skin and they, uh, they, they snuffed up people's noses or they scratched it into the skin, depending on where it was done. That, that sort of caught on in the Middle East. What they did was do this in young children. Young children um, had, had a good immune response. They generally survived smallpox. So what you were doing essentially is giving them smallpox and they survived. Whereas if they got it when they were older, they'd have a much worse disease. We do the same actually with measles and mumps. Uh, the vaccine we give to kids is, is very safe, but uh, mumps particularly in older men uh, was a real problem. I mean, terrible disease and uh, hospitalised people for months or so, and big problem with militaries uh, during World War One and World War Two, and a lot of men may have been left sterile by it. So, um, so it's not an un unthinkable thing. So what happened then was the the Chinese practice of, um, of of infecting people with smallpox caught on in the Middle East, and a very feisty English lady, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was married to the um, English ambassador to um, uh, what's now, I guess, Iran, uh, those countries, 
um, Persia, uh, the plenipotentiary. He was the plenipotentiary. I'm not sure what the difference between a plenipotentiary and an ambassador is, but that's what he was. Uh, she took the practice back to England, interested the local doctors in it, and uh, Edward Jenner, the, the physician, uh, was a variolator. He was scarif- scratching smallpox into young people's arms. And of course, you know, some, some kids did die from this, and so it wasn't totally innocuous. And it, it got across to America too. It was a doctor called Boylston who took it up there. If you're ever in Boston, if you know Boston at all, Boylston Avenue is named after him. It's right in the uh, center of Boston. So, um, so then Edward Jenner, though, uh, realized that milkmaids weren't getting smallpox. And uh, he reasoned that the pox virus uh, on the teat of the cow, cowpox, was actually protecting the milkmaids. So they were getting infected with that, even though we didn't understand infection at all at that stage. So he took some of the stuff off the teat of the cow, scratched it into the arm of a small boy, and then gave him smallpox. And it's a bit hard to get through an ethics committee now, but yeah. and that's where vaccinia came from. So vaccinia, vaca, is the cow. So oh. vaccination it refers to cows. So the anti-vaxxers of the 19th century uh, all drew cartoons uh, with people with cow horns coming out their head or uh, uh, people (laughs) getting into cows by being vaccinated with cow virus, which, of course, is totally absurd. But but the way it was done, they grew the virus in the skin of a cow and uh, a calf. And basically, if you you can see some engravings of this, people in the late 19th century uh, fashionable Parisians coming into a tent set up, I suppose, in the Bois or somewhere uh, with a calf tethered outside where they took the material from the calf, they scratched it into the arm of people. And that's vaccination or vaccinia. That approach with a bit of modification to grow it in cell cultures as well as in uh, cattle uh, was used to eradicate smallpox and we've eradicated it. Now, one of the vaccines that's in test at Geelong uh, for a British group from Oxford is what's called modified vaccinia ankara. This is a very mild vaccinia strain where they plopped a bit of the coronavirus genome into the vaccinia and they're using the vaccinia to vaccinate, um, to vaccinate people. So you could be variolating MVA or vaccinating people with MVA, scratching it into the arm. Now, that's the way... Uh, people of my generation were all vaccinated like that, Vari- variolational vaccination, scratching it into the arm, uh, and, and, and it would come up as a little pustule or nodule and, uh, and then go down and we'd be immune. Mm. So, so, I mean... If- COVID-19, I don't know, but it, it would take a brave soul <laughs> to, uh, to be a, a, a test candidate. Yeah, I mean, subject. younger people who are not severely affected, it, it's possible. But you'd have to be enormously careful that they didn't get any dose through their nose. But there would be ways of doing this. I mean, another way of doing that is to actually attenuate the COVID-19 virus. And that, and by attenuating, you would actually knock out some of the genes that allow it to cause disease and allow it to multiply a whole lot. And then you would have what's called an attenuated vaccine. And that's really what the mumps and measles vaccines are. They're, they're attenuated vaccines. The Sabin uh, Polio vaccine is one of those. It's an attenuated vaccine. They were just weakened decades ago much in a much more primitive way by passaging them through tissue cultures. And they underwent mutation to lose virulence. They were tested very thoroughly in monkeys and so forth and then given to humans. Is this something that could be achieved in the near term if, like, the vaccine uh, timeline ends up looking like it's going to be longer? If it was an absolutely catastrophic situation, if it was like the situation that's depicted in Contagion, where, you know, everyone who's within 100 feet of the virus gets it and dies, yes, it it could be reasonable. But I don't, I think with a virus where 80 plus percent of people are definitely um, 
mildly infected at worst or, or so not sick enough to go into hospital. More than 80% are not sick enough to go into hospital. I, I don't think you would take risk with that. I mean, the thing about a vaccine is you have to give it to large numbers of normal people. You can't take risk with vaccines. And, uh, and you can take risk with end-stage therapy. If, if someone's very, very sick and you've got something you think might work, you can try it pretty easily. Uh, people will approve that, especially if it's a drug that's approved for use in humans for some some other purpose. But uh, you can't take risk with vaccines, and and the the magnitude of the severity of this threat is not that is not great enough to do that. I mean, you could say, well, yes, we'll take a risk, but only with the people who are really at risk. So you could say, well, we'll take a vaccine that looks a bit risky, maybe, and we'll give it to the elderly. I mean, these are the people who are at risk, um, they can try it. Um, most of them aren't working anymore. So, uh, and you know, uh, they're all getting imputation credits or whatever it is. So uh, there we are. And uh, uh, I'm just being trivial. We don't want to put anyone at risk, of course. But I mean, the elderly might, uh, we, we've, people like me, have, we've had a good, long and happy life and, and um, have, have achieved a reasonable degree of satisfaction. People like me would, would say volunteer. I certainly would, I'd, I'd give it a go. And uh, and see if that uh, that works, but uh, but we wouldn't want to be giving a vaccine that had any risk at all to younger people. So you know these are these are all theoretical arguments. Uh, there's no way anything is ever given to anybody in this sense without going through extremely thorough review processes, both yeah. at uh, the level of institutions like our medical school um, ethics committees and uh, and then by our own therapeutic goods administration or and the and everything is always done along diet guidelines done by the fda so so you know these are p policy decisions if you're going to take any risk at all with a particular target group for a vaccine um i think it's pretty unlikely but uh, so but we may end up with a situation where the majority of people are really out and about or because they've had infection or whatever or because they just have to relax they relax the controls because there's uh, there just doesn't seem to be much virus out there but people like me will still have to be very careful i just want to ask a, a couple of questions about the future and looking ahead quickly um now i don't know how popular rejuvenation biotechnology or regenerative medicine is really outside of uh, futurist circles but one thing i find fascinating is some of the research being done about restoration of the thymus and somehow stopping the lymph nodes from blocking naive T-cell production. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of him. I'm not sure if I've got the details right, but um, Yanko Nikolic Zudgic from Arizona, I think is... Yeah, I know. Have you heard of him? Yeah, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's a perfectly feasible. That's been, it's been talked about for generations, and we've done the experiments in mice for years. Um, people have done experiments where they transplant young thymuses into old mice and all that sort of thing. So we, we're good at transplanting. And so there's been a body of research on that for decades. And, uh, but of course, the, the, the immune system is not the only thing that goes wrong in old people. I think the, the problem for us with the elderly, we can keep people alive if they don't have functioning immune systems quite, quite readily, really. Uh, we do it all the time. We give them uh, uh, human immunoglobulin. Uh, it's uh, it's basically the um, the plasma fraction, plasma serum fraction that comes off from blood donations, and CSL, uh, which is an Australian company, of course, is a leading Australian blood products company, and this is one of the major blood products. So we can give them people passive immunisation with uh, with immunoglobulin. They need to be injected every uh, month or so, I think it is, or maybe more frequently. I'm not sure. Uh, because there's a half-life for the antibody, it sort of washes out in the blood. But uh, but we've got all sorts of people protected in the society before by that. That's why we don't have to put kids in who don't have an immune system in a bubble anymore. We can protect them. And there's an enormous effort that's moving very, very, very fast. And this is more on the drug side of things, though it's an antibody. These are monoclonal antibodies. These are very, very specific antibodies for the virus. So this is another protective mechanism we could use. We, we could uh, take... Firstly, there's convalescent serum from people who've recovered in, from infection. That's being looked at by CSL, how they get that stuff out there. And we're keeping a, a close watch, of course, on all the people who've had it. They're good potential donors. But we could also import it from China or Italy or any country that's had a high incidence of infection. And we could give that to people. 
that would protect the elderly as just as it would protect the uh, the vulnerable who have uh, uh, diabetes and various other uh, problems which make them much more susceptible. And we could add to that, if, as long as we are sure they're safe, monoclonal antibodies against the virus, and we can manipulate those monoclonal antibodies to uh, remove one of the potential dangers of, of antibody, and that's what's called immune enhancement, where the bit of the antibody molecule, if you think of it, an IgG, an immunoglobulin G molecule, it's in a Y shape. So, so two arms of the Y, if you think of antibody binding to a protein as a lock and key mechanism, two arms of the Y have the same key on, but another part of the, the third part of the Y actually sticks to a cell called the macrophage or monocyte, which has the job of mopping things up in the body, but it can, by sticking the virus through its lock and key, to the antibody and then the antibody sticking to a cell, you can get a phenomenon called immune enhancement where the antibody t helps to take it into the macrophage and you increase the severity of the infection. That's one of the things we're concerned about with vaccine and we have to watch for. But if you've got monoclonal antibodies made in culture, you can chop off that third arm of the Y. So that can't happen. So you'll have the bit that binds to the virus stops it binding, say, to a cell surface protein that allows it to get into the cell and, and stops the infection that way. So monoclonal antibodies may be a very, very important in this, both as a transitional uh, kind of biological drug and, and for prevention and therapy. And, uh, and in the long term, may be added to uh, the, the human immunoglobulin we normally take uh, to protect um, the vulnerable. So, so you know, we've got a, an incredible uh, armamentarium of modern science that none of this existed in 1918. And this virus is not, I think, going to kill as many people as 1918 flu did. And uh, basically, that, uh, that armamentarium, though, uh, we have to take a little time to bring it into, uh, into actual use. And most of the delay really is not in uh, producing the stuff. These stuffs are, this stuff's being made already, the monoclonals, the drugs and stuff, uh, probably making uh, predominantly drugs. The, the long-term problem is in two things. One, it's in, um, it, it, it's in testing for safety. And the other one is in ramping up production to get a lot of doses. Now, someone said about a vaccine, well, we're gonna need Eight billion doses because we've got eight billion people. No, we won't need eight billion doses because by the time we get around to the vaccine, you might think probably half the people on the planet have been infected, and uh, hopefully not in Australia. We may have shut it down, but but if half the people on the planet are infected and we test them and they've got antibodies, um, well, they don't need a vaccine straight off. And then of course the younger people anyway are relatively protected. So. If you're prioritizing the vaccine, the very first people to get a vaccine or any protection would be healthcare workers, frontline personnel, indigenous communities, people who are at risk uh, from intercurrent problems like diabetes, uh, and, and I guess in the end analysis, older people um, from 60 on. So, so anyway, that, but they're all policy decisions. Now, Caucasians seem to have like a genetic variation, A2, I think you called it. Um, is that something that we could like confer onto other people through some sort of somatic future gene therapy program? <laughs> A A2 is a, a major histocompatibility complex protein. Uh, A2 is one of the molecules. These, these molecules present little bits of virus to the other arm of the immune system, the cell mediated immune system, the killer T cells. My colleague at, uh, um, at, the, at the Institute, Catherine Kizieska, uh works on this. Uh, that's what I worked on for years. That's what I discovered. We discovered uh, part of this uh, story way back, and that's why I got the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And so A2 is, does seem to confer some resistance on Caucasians against flu strains because it presents a peptide. It, A2 is very common in Caucasians, and uh, it, it presents a peptide which is cross-reactive between a lot of the flu viruses and gives us some background immunity. T cell immunity doesn't give us this kind of sterilizing immunity we can get with viruses because the immunity has to be recalled from what we call immune memory. Now, we're getting a bit complicated here, I know, but I'm afraid immunology is a complicated subject. 
but that can confer a degree of protection. And Catherine did beautiful work in collaboration with a wonderful group in, at Fudan University in China during the H7 and 9 uh, incidents of several years back, uh, examining the cell, cell mediated immune response and showing that the capacity to make rapid cellular immune responses, which presumably indicates cross-reactive T-cell memory, uh, was, was broadly protective, even in people who were hospitalized. Those who had a lot of those cells uh, did well, uh, those who didn't did badly. But there's a problem that A2 is, though it's common in Caucasians, it's not common in our indigenous communities, except of course where, as is often the case, uh, there has been um, um, crossbreeding, so to speak, between uh, Europeans and, and Indigenous people, and but it's at low le lower levels in our Indigenous communities. We think that could be one of the reasons Indigenous communities are more threatened by flu. Now, I don't think we know about a lot a lot about that yet with COVID nineteen and the coronavirus, but that's one of the things that Catherine's lab is working flat out on, and there will be other similar labs across the planet who are doing this as well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think you also mentioned in a like a sci future talk that there was there has been a lot of uh, technological progress, and that's part of the reason why we've seen such um, great progress in being able to combat infections. But what about intellectual progress? How do we? Uh, it, I think you were mentioning that there hasn't been as much intellectual progress as there's been technological progress. Is, is this going to be a problem moving forward? Oh, well, it depends what you mean by intellectual progress. I mean, there's fantastic intellectual progress in the scientific community about the science. Um, but uh, it wouldn't be a surprise to you if I say that very few of my American scientific, scientific colleagues would have voted for Donald Trump, which is uh, who, who is a, a primary symptom of major intellectual decline. So uh, intellectual progress it's not my field. I'm a lab scientist and I trained as a vet, but, you know, I, I have written a lot of books and things and I've talked with a lot of people over the years. One of the privileges of, of winning the Nobel Prize is anyone will talk to you, no matter how silly you are. So, uh, so I've enjoyed some, some contact there. Uh, I think uh, intellectual progress in the sense of the incredible technologies we have out there. One of the things we've had since we've... Um, uh, obviously become a point of contact for uh, the, uh, um, the the COVID-19 research in Australia. There's, there's a lot of extraordinary interest and really intriguing offers from people who have, uh, say, various IP, pro, uh, 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 various uh, uh, communications, uh, data handling uh, uh, resources that would normally be used commercially for various activities for banking and so forth. But asking, uh, you know, can my people help with this? And of course, the data generation, data, data handling, our epidemiologists that we've been hearing so much about lately, all depends on that massive computational capacity. Our uh, genetic uh, analysis, the uh, sequencing of these viruses that's been done, for instance, in the, uh, by Ben Howden's group at the Doherty Institute, uh, as, uh, is, is giving us rapid sequence information on these viruses that allows us to track lineages of viruses. That all, de all depends on massive computational capacity. It depends on computing capacity and all the rest of it. So intellectual uh, in the sense of the technology is extraordinary. Intellectual in the sense of how we approach these uh, complex and difficult problems, well, that's another question. I, I think... Uh, uh, though many political leaders have done very well and stepped up to the plate, Justin Trudeau has been magnificent. Dan Andrews, our mm. premier in Victoria, has been great. Scott Morrison has done really well with this. He's he's tried to he's got on top of it. It took him took him a little while. I mean, it's unfamiliar territory, and uh, these guys are very busy. But he he got on top of it. He's been uh, been putting out solid policy and doing all the right things on the uh, particularly on the financial front that really needed to be done. So it's been a, a extraordinary, in an intellectual sense, to watch a, a, a fairly right-wing government, should we say, uh, become essentially uh, the, uh, the most socialistic government in our, in our history of recent times, but um, I guess they won't maintain forever. But I hope it will cause a certain reset uh, in the way we think about things. I, I, think, I think this uh, neoliberal libertarian model, which is, is simply toxic, I mean, uh, unfettered capitalism without proper regulatory 
rules and without income distribution is simply toxic. And I think we all need, maybe we're starting to realize that we have to make sure that everybody in our society has some, some sort of roof over their head, that they have some sort of income, no matter how poor or, or out of the loop or even psychologically dysfunctional they are, we need to make sure that everybody has basic needs. And, and what we've seen uh, in this latest situation is the resources can be found to do that. And I think uh, it, it doesn't damage our economic model in the long term uh, to find those resources and maybe just give the rich people a little bit less and, uh, and, and stop, stop this, uh, this capitalist model, which is basically, uh, uh, basically um, uh, destroying society, quite frankly. And you can see it at most obviously in the United States where this particular form of intellectual poison uh, has been so prevalent. And so uh, there are great, great people, great institutions, great philanthropists, great people of great wealth who are doing an enormous amount that's good. And uh, you, Bill Gates would be obvious, uh, Warren Buffett's another. Uh, Jeff Bezoy, not everyone may love Jeff, but he's been putting a lot of money out there as well. Various people, Andrew Forrest has been putting money out there. Maybe there's some other ties there a bit, but the money is out there and that's important. And so I think we need to do a rethink on, on how we run our society because running a society on the basis that some people always have to be out of work and suffering is pretty crap in any, any decent human being's mindset. And uh, that's the way we've been running our society, that some people always have to be out of work, otherwise uh, there'll be a problem with labour. I, I think we have to rethink these things. I'm talking way out of turn. I'm a lab scientist. I'm not an economist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. I'm just an old guy. But I saw what was... I, I'm of a generation that experienced the enormous uh, return to society of what happened after World War II in, say, Britain and in Australia. And it wasn't necessarily all done by Labor prime ministers. There were liberals as well uh, who were doing this. But, but the introduction of national health systems in Britain, Canada, Australia, essentially, and, uh, and, and also the, the maintaining of a social safety net. We've been ripping that social safety net as people are more and more challenged by uh, uh, automation uh, globalization and all the rest of it. And maybe I think we now need to think maybe in some terms of some sort of a minimum wage. Maybe we give it to everyone. Give yeah. everyone a minimum wage, uh, take it back from the from the rich by having a 60% tax rate on it. Mm, I agree. Look, I could talk about UBI and universal basic income and, and rights to accommodation for a long time. But I have talk, taken a lot of your time, Peter. So it, it really has been wonderful. Uh, to talk to you about all this and so many topics have been covered um if there's any sort of concluding statements uh that you know you can think of making um yeah the, the, the well uh, my concluding statement would be this it, this isn't the end of the world by any means i think people realize that uh, it's not going to wipe out humanity uh it's it's a it's a, a dangerous and deadly disease but i think within a year uh, for various reasons we'll be largely through this but it may take that long. Um, we need a vaccine. What we need, though, from people, everybody, each and every one of us, is responsible behaviour and taking guidelines. I think the government guidelines that are being put out are being put out on, out on the basis of uh, serious epidemiological modelling. Some of that's just been released. People complained because it was all modelling based on Northern Hemisphere data, but, but you know, that's the data we had. Uh, we didn't have enough data from Australia. You can't model uh, in, a, in a serious way without having a data, data sets, and, and that's where the data was coming from. Um, modelling in Australia will come later as we progress with this. So we'll get through this. Uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, a, a massive long-term problem, but we need highly responsible behaviour now. Watch what government is saying. Uh, comply with what's being said. And, uh, and, and by doing that, you will protect people who are very vulnerable, including many disabled people and so forth. And, and you will protect what's enormously important, protect our frontline people 
our supermarket checkout operators, our police, our, uh, our, 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 and above all, of course, every, every aspect of our healthcare workforce from AMBOs to nurses to check-in people to, to, the, to the ICU doctors and nurses who are at greatest risk. Mm. Thank you so much. I appreciate this. So thanks everybody for listening and watching. And if you like the channel, please subscribe. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with it. <laughs>